All right, how's it going, y'all? So today we are diving into a topic that is guaranteed to cause a ton of controversy. And that is the question, OpenVPN versus WireGuard versus L2TP over IPsec. What is the best remote access VPN? And there's no one right answer to this. There's a wrong answer and not to spoil it, it's L2TP over IPsec. I would highly recommend getting off L2TP over IPsec but between OpenVPN and WireGuard, they're very hard to choose between because WireGuard is hands down a much faster protocol, but OpenVPN in a lot of ways is just going to be better and easier to use. And we're gonna talk about all of that in today's video. All right, and so before we get into all this, we need to kind of set the bounds for what we're talking about. What we are talking about today is you have a VPN server that you're self-hosting for you or your office. You want people to be able to remotely connect to it for security. You've got a NAS, you've got other servers, local, that you don't want to expose to the internet. It's the most secure way to operate a business, hands down. But you've got remote employees who need to be able to connect to the NAS or any of the other things we talked about earlier from a coffee shop, from their laptop. How do you go about doing it? There are really kind of two separate options. You can either go for something like Tailscale, which is a fully managed paid service VPN. Tailscale is a great service, they've never sponsored me or anything like that, that allows you to easily connect to a bunch of different resources and it is really set up for offices to implement. It is also free for like five users, I believe, definitely something to check out, and it is based off of WireGuard. So that is the paid service or the managed VPN route. I do believe there is a way to self-host it, but for right now, we're going to be talking about Tailscale and all similar things like that as their own managed service one. And if you were looking at this video talking about NordVPN or another privacy VPN, we're gonna throw those all in the same category. And then the other category is self-hosted. So self-hosted is you're using the protocol as it is standardly written, L2TP over IPsec, OpenVPN, and WireGuard. You can easily deploy most of these VPN servers on most prosumer routers and most NASs as well. What they do is they allow you to remotely connect to the office. That means that if I'm on my computer right here and I sign into a VPN server located somewhere else, it will route all of my traffic or specified traffic, that's called split tunneling, to that network. So if it routes all my traffic, I will be Googling if I go to the Google, Google will think I'm coming from that office. If I do split tunnel, they probably don't want all your traffic, all your Google, all your YouTube going through that internet connection because that'll be a bottleneck. And instead, only when I'm connecting to the office NAS will my traffic be encrypted over this VPN tunnel. All three of the protocols we talked about can do that and do that very well. The reason you do this is twofold. One, it encrypts all the traffic directly from your laptop to that network. That means you can be sending plain text passwords over a web page over HTTP and nobody between your laptop and the router or whatever server will be able to read that because it is being sent over with encryption. So one reason you do it is encryption. The other is security because now you don't have to open up the NAS, your local office file server, your local web server that handles people's time cards or sensitive information, you don't have to open that up to the internet at all. You just block everybody from being able to access it unless they're either on the VPN or on the local network. That also means that now you can remote desktop into any of the machines that are set up with a remote desktop. It is a great thing to have. Having a self-hosted VPN server can make a huge security upgrade to businesses because no longer are you opening up remote desktop to the internet. By the way, please don't open up remote desktop to the internet. I see it far too many times when I'm doing work for different clients who have set up this thing on their own. Really make sure if you're opening something up to the internet, it is designed to be opened up to the internet. And so that's really what we're gonna be talking about today. To quickly touch on those paid VPN services, both for actual mesh networks to actually get to office servers like I talked about, or so you can watch Netflix in another country. So both of those, I'm gonna give a simple answer to those. Use WireGuard if you can. All the cons I'm gonna talk about with WireGuard are pretty much fixed when you've got a managed service like that. So 
if it gives you an option, first thing you should try is WireGuard. If it works, because they've got a client, then WireGuard is going to blow the other Drupal protocols out of the water in terms of performance and overall overhead. It is designed for that, it is phenomenal for that. So if you have the option to use WireGuard with one of those managed services, that's the very first thing you should try because if it works, then you're set. It is going to be the best option. That right there is why this video is going to be controversial. Because while WireGuard is by far the fastest and also the least intrusive protocol, it does a lot of things to hide its presence and things like that. It is also the hardest of all of them to manage. And that is why it's not for everybody. And in fact, the majority of time I'm deploying something for a business, I do not recommend deploying a WireGuard self-hosted server because the advantages that it has are going to be quickly outweighed by how complex it is to set up and deploy. That right there is why this is a controversial video. All right, so let's take a quick step back here and talk about our three protocols. The first one is going to be L2TP over IPsec. This is actually a Cisco owned protocol. They kind of open sourced it or opened it up. I'm not even sure what happened with that, but Cisco owns it, but they let other people use it. And it's really only saving grace when we're talking about it here is the fact that it is pre-installed on iOS, Android, Mac OS, Windows. All of those have a L2TP over IPsec VPN server, VPN client pre-installed on them. That means it can actually be a useful option to deploy in circumstances where really minimal setup is required on each device. You don't wanna to have to install a client on everybody. And that is its real one saving grace. It has those clients pre-installed. Now I will say, because Cisco owns it, they kind of control it. And at one point they told Microsoft, no, 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 you deployed L2TP over IPsec wrong. Microsoft pushed an update and broke all the self-hosted L2TP over IPsec VPNs on there. So that is a major con of it and why I really don't deploy it anymore, if at all possible. It also does, in my experience, disconnect quite often. It is not nearly as stable as WireGuard and OpenVPN. And so that's why I very rarely recommend it. But in cases where you have no other option because you can't install stuff on an end client, but they're allowed to connect to an L2TP over IPsec VPN, there is that. There is something to say that with a few pieces of information, you can go to a random computer and get on your VPN server. There is an advantage to that. But in general, the cons do outweigh the pros of using L2TP over IPsec. So I very rarely would recommend it. That's gonna be the least controversial of all of these. Next up in our development train of all time, the next one that was developed was OpenVPN. And OpenVPN is what it sounds like. It is an open VPN. That means that it is open source software. And so anybody can deploy it. And because of that, it works great with self-hosted stuff. Pretty much all consumer-friendly NASes will have both a client and a server for it. And it is very easy to set up, though it does have a couple of cons when it comes to actually creating the certificates and things like that that I want to get into. OpenVPN actually uses the exact same encryption as web browsers do. It uses a public and a private key encryption that is based off of a certificate. So you actually use the exact same certificate file you would to do HTTPS to actually build an OpenVPN server. Now, if you're wanting to deploy an OpenVPN server from scratch, it's actually pretty difficult to set up. You have to do a bunch of things. You've got to create a certificate authority and things like that. But if you're deploying on a router or a NAS, it's incredibly easy because they handle all that for you. And so OpenVPN has a ton of flexibility. It's been tried and true for a very long time and has a free client that is available on everything. Mac, Windows, Linux, iPhone, Android. Whole gambit's covered. So OpenVPN Connect is a OpenVPN client that works with Windows, Mac, Linux, iPhone, Android, and also Chrome OS, how nice. They do also make a paid product, which is their OpenVPN server that it's called Access Server. So it's kind of built for offices who want to be able to deploy a Office VPN server very easily. And it's priced somewhat expensively, but the client itself is free. One big downside right off the bat here is they sometimes push out an update to this client that will break connections. I've seen it before. And so 
I have had issues with two different updates of OpenVPN Connect where they broke something that they should not have. So that is a true downside to it. But other than that, the client is incredibly easy to use and works really well in my opinion. You will see right here, I've got a ton of blurred out configs right here because this is what I use to manage a lot of my clients' NASs. I just VPN into their network and can access everything. It's incredibly easy to add a new configuration file, just drag and drop. OpenVPN is by far the easiest, in my experience, to get end users to deploy, other than L2TP over IPsec, but unfortunately, that has all those bugs that I talked about earlier. And so that's one of the really nice things about OpenVPN. One other thing is, it supports username password authentication, which for businesses is huge. It makes your life so much easier because as an IT administrator, you can create one OpenVPN configuration file, hand it out to all of your users, and use a backend authentication server, such as your NAS username and password or LDAP or Windows Active Directory, and boom, you just give them all one file and they use that and their username and password to authenticate, which is really useful. Next and final, we have WireGuard, the darling of the open source community. WireGuard is a VPN that is designed to be the replacement for all other VPNs. WireGuard is incredibly fast. It was like a PhD dissertation on one of the fastest ways to do it. Blows all the other ones out of the water. It is also designed to be incredibly low overhead and hard to detect, which is both good and bad. If you are purely self-hosting where you are writing your own WireGuard server and by just using a Linux app to get, it is also probably the easiest to set up because WireGuard uses very basic pre-shared keys. The WireGuard config files are very simple, though there is a lot to them at the same time, but there's a lot of advantages there. WireGuard servers are also undetectable when exposed to the internet because they are designed not to respond to anything unless it matches the proper encryption key. While that sounds great, it is also the biggest pain in the world when you're an administrator trying to deploy one of these. And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute here. Okay, so WireGuard is great when it's set up with its own format. As I said at the top of this video, if you are using a managed VPN service like Tailscale or NordVPN, go with WireGuard. Tailscale, that's the only option you've got. And if it works and somebody else is managing it, Man, it is super fast. You won't even notice the latency. Awesome. But as an administrator, trying to set it up and deploy it for your users, there are a few really big downsides to it. The first is WireGuard does not support username password authentication. The way WireGuard works is every single client has its own unique pre-shared key. And that is what's used to negotiate a connection. That means every employee's Laptop, phone, iPad, all require a separate configuration file that is unique to that employee. So that is one of the downsides of it. It is great when it's automated, but if you as the IT administrator have to deploy this for a bunch of employees, you're going to have a time because every single device needs a new config file. And you can't just plug it into your backend LDAP server because it does not support username password authentication. It's only those key files that is used for authentication. Number two reason that it is difficult as a local administrator, and trust me, I deploy WireGuard servers quite often for my own stuff. The fact that it is undetectable makes it insanely hard to figure out where a bug is if something's not going through. Because if your WireGuard server is down, because it's undetectable, your client will still say that it's connected even though the server is down and nothing's responding because that's how WireGuard is designed to work. And so as somebody who is self-hosting this stuff and trying to get it set up for a business and employee says, everything's down, you don't know if the WireGuard server's down, if their routing table's messed up or what, because you can't see any of it. That is one major gripe I have with WireGuard and makes it very hard to debug issues, especially when you're setting up a WireGuard server for the very first time because it always says connected, even if nothing's actually routing through it and nothing's responding on that table. So the third difficult thing that makes it hard to recommend for businesses is the clients. So as I showed, 
the OpenVPN client, great. Super easy to add new ones. But now let's look at the WireGuard server. It is significantly more janky to set up. When we hit new, literally you start just typing in configurations and public keys and private keys. It is very, very, very difficult to set up in that case. And once again, this is an invalid WireGuard server. I'm gonna hit connect. It says active, even though it does not actually work. So there's a lot of pieces to WireGuard that make it much harder to set up and stuff that I think makes it a lot harder for Bob and HR to figure out how to use. Because this interface, believe it or not, is way more intimidating than something like your OpenVPN Connect right here. It is just so much more intimidating. You can't really tell what's going on. Here, it's nice because when you connect, oh, it shows you a nice little green status symbol. It shows you your connection. It shows stuff going through. You can tell what's going on. That's stuff that makes this so much easier to deploy when you're getting clients to set them up, especially when it's people who are not that tech savvy. You can simply say, download OpenVPN Connect, drag in a file, put in your username and password and hit connect. And when you see the big old green connected and you see traffic flowing, that means now you can access stuff. I have done it and truly it is easier to describe and show people how to use an OpenVPN server than how to use a WireGuard tunnel because of the interfaces. Now, all this could change in five years. Specifically, the interfaces are gonna get better. WireGuard is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and so more clients are gonna come out with it. And so eventually somebody's gonna build a client with a nice pretty interface that makes it so that Bob and HR can figure out how to use it and use it well. The two issues that are always going to be there though is the username password authentication, because that is just something that makes your life way easier if you can send out everybody gets one file and they all use the same file and they just are separated by username and password. And having that hidden connection where if you're not connected, it still says you're connected, makes it very hard as an IT administrator to run. And that's why I said earlier, if somebody else is managing the service like NordVPN or Tailscale, where all that stuff is hidden behind it and is all managed by a third party who does this programmatically, then that is why WireGuard, there's zero question about using it because it has all those great features. But as something you're deploying for an office network or even your own home VPN, is the increased performance worth it when it makes it significantly harder to debug? That's a question you have to answer for yourself. And there is still a world where you can use both of them because they both have pros and cons and it depends on what you need. All right. Well, I'm sure that's gotten some controversy down in the comments below. Leave your opinion down there. If you want to hire me for a project, there's a link for that down in the description below. All right, have a good one. Bye.